you as a Christian understand. No, I wouldn't say. No, no. Culturally Christian. Okay. Yeah. Understand how people are made matter. Yeah. That's. Yeah. You cannot. For instance, to imagine that the universe goes on forever, infinity, it's. You can't. I can't even. Comprehend, you can't comprehend that. But I don't so, believe the universe is infinite. The universe is finite. Where is it? Where is it expanding? Because it's finite. I think it's beyond us. No, no, no. The universe is finite. It's, is the universe finite or infinite? Because if you look at the cosmic background radiation, that indicates that once the, the universe was dense and it was hot. So the cosmic background radiation, we have readings of that. Um, and the fact, of course, there's something called redshift. There's enough kind of strong evidence to suggest that the universe is indeed expanding and it was once a hot dense kind of uh, thing have you got coffee in there no, okay i don't coffee. i don't want you to get no, burnt yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then if obviously it's expanding and when you reverse that time it comes to a kind of point from which it came from so a lot of scientists i think the most prevalent theory today in science is the big bang theory that's the best the steady state theory is it's, it's, it's like kind of going against the tide sort of thing. So what do you think about cosmic background radiation? The fact that, no idea. I mean, there's so many people here today and it's, everybody's arguing their point about different types of our religion. It's not necessarily it's better, but there always seems to be... Um, no, he didn't say that, he said that. And I, what I believe about in the Bible, I'm not really... I'm like that with the Bible as well, because I, the Bible for me was written well over 2,000 years ago by a man who I think put in what they wanted to put in because they could do that. That's why I was saying earlier the, the stories of Mary Magdalene supposed to be married to Jesus barely gets a right in the Bible because if you think back 2,000 years ago, we've, we've even got men's claps now. So 2,000 years ago, women really didn't get a say. So I, I sort of scratch my head. Everybody quotes from the Bible, but I don't believe necessarily that's what happened. I, I love watching programs like this. Watch the program about um, crucifixion. These archaeologists and I can't remember the Roman. Uh, the Roman chap who turned to Christianity. He had a dream, and it was just a cross. But when they looked into this, I'm sort of going off track here. But when they looked into it. And there was some very old um, buildings that they found, and they had a cross like this, it was a cross, like an X, not a cross as we know it. And they said that to be crucified, they have to be very efficient, and to have an actually cross, it wouldn't have happened, because by the time that the, this Roman general discovered that he wanted to embrace Christianity, it was 300 years before the last crucifixion and people would go like well i can't remember how they did it but he had a dream about a cross and this is what this was just a documentary so they said when you were crucified it was by an x very quickly and it, it worked the same and it, you would never have been crucified with your hands like this you would have been crucified like that because it's more painful and the way that it goes in it would have gone to your wrist and not your hand right so there's you know when you see every single thing in the church it's through his wrist there's a lot lost we, we don't really know let, let me ask you a question yeah. so what's your name gordon gordon yeah so gordon let's just have a i'm not i'm i'm, I'm don't look at me we're having like, a nice I conversation know what you're talking about. I just, it's like you said when it comes to speakers corner everyone is kind of giving their points yeah. and how do you analyze those points yeah. by the veracity by, by rationality, by logic, by common sense. I'm like sort of open mind. So let me ask you something. Hypothetically, let's just say you were to accept this now. What do you need to be meant for you to say, you know what? Islam is the religion. That's met this criteria, no other religion. List me that criteria. So, um, so if there was Christianity, Buddhism, or all these, yeah. well, I think Buddhism is a religion, but. I couldn't really. It's just it would, have to, it would have to come to me. I couldn't. Well, I would choose it, but it would have to be. I want, it would probably take a, a year or two years. What I, what I mean is, let's just say fast forward. Yeah. A year's taken, <laughs> and then you you're in the park or we're having coffee somewhere, yeah. and you said, you know what? 
Islam is the religion. And then I ask you, how, how did you arrive to this point? What would you tell me? What boxes needed to be ticked that have been ticked? From my point of view, I... Because you've got to be sincere, Gordon, isn't it? If you're claiming to find the truth... But, but, well, that's me being open-minded. So from my point of view, I, I, I don't like... I'm not going to follow a religion. Maybe, maybe there's a bit of... Because I believe that everything has a right to live. Everything, no matter what it does or whatever. Um, everything's got a right to live. And you should believe that, at least. But I, I just generally try and be nice to people. And I think you get so many hypocrites who study religion, different religions, and they, I can't stand the hypocrisy of it, basically. Um, that's maybe put a lot of people off. But I, I agree. I mean, a, a sensible individual or somebody, I think nowadays, for you to be considered wise, I would say you have to adopt the philosophy, which is you don't judge the religion by the adherence of the religion. Because if you do that, then even bus drivers, even you know cashiers, everybody, you know, there'll be an issue with with, with somebody with every religion. So you have to come back to something objective, logic, rationality, reason. So I guess what I'm saying to you is, logically, what would you say the criteria needs to be for you to go, you know what, it's Islam? Because in terms of implementation, I agree with you. There's all sorts of people and people pulling you in different directions. But let's just say we strip that to the side and then we say, okay, rationality, what would you say, yes? Would the concept of God in Islam need to make sense? Well, that's another topic. Do you, top of my head. Would you agree the concept of God foremost needs to make sense? You can't say, oh, God is a rat, someone stepped on it, and that's the end of it. You'd say that doesn't make any sense. The concept of God has to be such that it, your heart and your mind is in tune with it, sync with it. So it tells you that God is the most perfect being, the most absolute being who is self sufficient, who is independent who is not in any need, perfect. You will say, that seems to be the concept of God that I can accept, not a God who is deficient, imperfect, limited, weak, because that cannot be God, because the creator of this universe, this magnificent universe, That's fine. That's fine. the magnificent universe has to be created by someone who is so powerful. And now if I give an example of someone who is weak, how can you even say that? So, it has to make sense. It also has to be a concept in which there is one absolute originator of this universe, not two. Because if there are two, there will be a conflict of will and there will be chaos and ruin of this universe. If there are more than one absolute creator of our universe, what's going to happen? Well, can I ask you a question? When did you, as a child, you were, you had been studying, um, you were a Muslim? Born as a Muslim, yes. Yeah. Everyone is a born in a, either a Muslim or in a state of disposition of what we call fitra. It is their parents, the environment that makes them Jews, Christians, fire worshippers and so on. But every child is born in a state of this natural disposition in which they are already aligned with worshipping a higher being. They're already, the heart is already aligned. They're hardwired, yeah. if I want to use this word. So if a child is left alone, without anyone indoctrinating them, they will have this belief there is a, someone creator up there who created all of these things. You don't have to teach them. It's their already programmed, hardwired. Well, so I was born, of course, yeah. I was born in a Muslim family. Yeah. Some people may not be in a Muslim family, which you know, indoctrinates and changes their belief system. But it came to a point where we are discussing with other fellow human beings with different ideas and belief systems, different theologies. So you can't simply then stick blindly to your faith and say, I'm going to follow my forefathers. My belief in a scripture called the Quran tells me that this approach is wrong because it says those people who follow and say, I am going to stick to and follow my forefathers. The Quran says, what if they are wrong? Yeah. What if they were wrong? So critical thinking is something that is 
really encourage in Islam to use the intellect. And the example I gave you earlier on, look at all this magnificent assembly and so on. It cannot be a product of nothingness because nothingness itself does not have self-awareness, doesn't exist. How can it make something? But that, that's a belief, whether it be evolution, I agree. No, before evolution, before evolution, yeah. if something exists now, let's try to understand one, one, one thing only. If something like you and I exist, could there be a time in the past there was absolute nothingness, where there was nothing, no energy, nothing? No, there's never been that, I don't believe. Is it possible that there was something like that, where there was nothing, and then something came? No, that's going back millions of years now. Go, it doesn't matter how many millions and billions and zillions and trillions and quadrillions and, and a Google Plex. One, right? I don't even know what the biggest number is, right? The fact is, nothingness cannot make anything. It doesn't have existence. So, something existing now means something has to exist always. Now, here is the problem with this. Something existing always, with no beginning. What is that something? Because something has to exist always. That something cannot be given properties, attributes or qualities or characteristics by something else because there was no something else. This thing existed always without a beginning. So it must possess attributes and qualities inherently by itself. For example, energy or power, it possesses. No one gave it. The originator would inherently by itself possess energy or power would also will possess a will because from this no beginning entity we came with all this differentiation differentiation can only happen if someone wills it to make it different like that you choose it to be like this this tall that short and so on and so forth this choice was involved to make something like this in this differences if there is a will involved, I mean this is a conscious entity with a choice. Now, you know what we're getting at already? We are already affirming, without going into any religious scripture, that there is an originator of our universe. He not only possesses energy and power, but also is self-aware and has a will, and also must possess wisdom. Because to make things like this, with all this beautiful, harmonious, complex assembly that works, you need knowledge and wisdom. So we are already giving attributes to a thing that is almost equal to our creator of our cosmos. I didn't even use any a verse from the Quran. Even our common sense, our intuitions, our reasons, our intellect is making us to conclude that this is the reality. The next question would be, I cannot speculate about this absolute entity which has no beginning. So how do I know about this entity? It has to come from that entity to me because I'm finite. That's the role of revelation. That we look and examine the revelation, the scripture, the people who said we are agents of this spokesperson of this entity, prophets and messengers, we look into their life and we see that this indeed is the messenger who has told us without any corruption or change or amendment, who truly our creator is. So the Bible at one point was a message given from this entity, from this originator, to authentic, true prophets and messengers of God who conveyed it to the people, but people later on changed it. The change we can see in British Museum if you were to go there, how they changed and manipulated the text added, taken away, changed, you know, added a chapter, taken a chapter out, changed verse here and there. People did that. So we believe God in his mercy, he sent, creator in his mercy, sends prophets and messengers, one after the other, to every nation, so that people cannot have an excuse in the year after fulfilling their obligation. Because the creator is just. It makes sense to be just someone who is absolute. Why would he have a deficiency? Perfection is mean he's just. Imperfection is unjust, right? Unjust is imperfection. So 
in the past, there were prophets and messengers who came and had all the scriptures, but people corrupted them. The final messenger was sent by our creator. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Prophet Muhammad was given the final book called the Quran. The difference between the previous books and the previous prophets is because there was going to be no other prophet, no other book, the creator has taken himself the role of safeguarding it from any corruption. Because if that gets corrupted, then people will be at a loss. Because there's going to be no other messenger correcting this corrupted message. This message itself is now preserved. And that's why if you ask any Muslim about the Quran, anywhere you go on the planet, you say, okay, read me this Quran. And he would say, yeah, that's the Quran that we got from the Prophet. Memory and in writing. So preservation has guaranteed the text that was given, the guidance that was given, and the message that is within it, when you read the Quran, it says, I'll give you one example, a small chapter with three lines, and see whether it resonates with your heart or mind. It says, say he is Allah. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say he is God, Allah, the one, the only, the unique. Allahu samad. The one who is independent, absolute, sovereign, self-sufficient, free from all wants and needs. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. That's the Arabic. He is not born, neither does he produce children. Walam yakullahu kufu wan ahad. There is nothing unto him, any likeness or any comparison. There's no similarity or likeness unto him. One and only, self-sufficient, independent, absolute. Not born, doesn't give birth, no families, no offspring, and no likeness and similarities. Is there any way, any difficulty your heart and mind have with that concept? Of course not, because it's coherent, it makes sense, and it's something that your heart wants to believe about God. God has to be self-sufficient. God has to be one. God has to be unique. God has to be independent. God has to be not someone, there's another God whose father, his mother, his brother, his uncle, his, his, his children and his daughters and granddaughters. And if there is one absolute unique God with no father and no children and whatsoever, there will be no similarities. There will be no, people totally unique, no comparison. That is what we believe about our creator. That is what we ask you to consider to believe. So if you believe that God alone is worthy of worship, our gratitude, our utmost reverence, our surrendering submission of our will, saying, you know what is best for us, rather than me just working out and then saying, oh, communism is best, and you kill a few million people and then later you realize that's not a good. Democracy is better, something like that. No, you submit and surrender your will and say, God, he knows, our creator knows what is best for us. And the creator tells us how to live our life fulfilling our purpose and how to be saved from punishment in the hereafter if we were stubborn and arrogant by rejecting the truth. Because we are not here as a mere amusement and play. The creator is not someone who is just having a pastime. It, is, it de derives and devoids of any wisdom to say all of this is a pastime. The good and the bad are not the same. How can we equate it? The one who knows and the one who doesn't know are not the same. So we can't judge like that. So the Creator tells us, you are here, given the faculty of intellect and choice. This is the obligation you have to fulfill. If you don't, do you think you're going to end up the same, the same worm comes and eats you, the good and the bad? No. There will be a day of accountability, a day of recompense, in which you will have to account for your belief and your deeds, good and bad. If you did good, believed in correct belief about the Creator, God has promised you, He's prepared for you paradise in which no eyes have seen what's there for you, no ears have heard, something that you will be so much in delight, pleasure, bliss, tranquility, happiness, joy, serenity, all of this is prepared because you fulfill the purpose in this life. But if someone was arrogant and rejected the truth knowing it, they will face the consequence where they will be tortured because they're the ones chose to be in hellfire to be punished. But God says, save yourself. So he doesn't want any one of us to go to hell. 
He sends prophets and messengers. He sends even inspiration with people. Imagine a, a worshiper of an idol. A dog comes along while he is concentrating in worship, lifts his hind leg and urinating. It somehow stopped him from his meditation and says, what are you doing? You're defiling my God. Shouted at the dog, dog start running. He start running after the dog. At that point he realized, hang on. Why am I worshiping an idol who couldn't even save itself from defiling? How can it be God Almighty? That was an inspiration at that time from the Creator to saying, this is a false God. This kind of inspiration comes, God gives us to people here and there. You, people, what they do is they forego, they ignore these opportunities. And they say, oh, God hasn't guided me. God hasn't given me anything. He's given you clear evidence in the Quran. He's given you within your own, own lives. In examples in your life, you suddenly you see this and a spark comes along and you're saying, I still don't see any evidence, any proof for God. These people, they will be accountable for their negligence, for not using their intellect properly. Because the intellect has a role to play. And if you did not fulfill the role of the intellect, you will be responsible. So if God gives you a job to do, for example, and you don't do it, you will be accountable because he didn't just simply say, you know what, all of this intellect to discern between right and wrong, truth and falsehood, and he just sat there, you made them both the same. You'll be accountable. So how do we save ourselves from the hellfire is by looking at the revelation of God, because we can't just simply make our life and think this is the way best to live. Like, for example, some people do. I will live my life according to the best principles from Buddhism, from Zainism, from Islam, from Christianity. Some people do that because they're a bit, a bit at a loss into how to go about this. They're trying to get best for everything. But no, God, the creator, has spared us, spared us from this confusion and says, look, he sends guidance, scripture, to a prophet with proof and evidence so that you can be content and convinced of this is how to do. So when I see, for example, the Quran says, when your both of your parents reach old age, extend the wings of mercy. Do not even say oof to them. What do people do? They send their old pal to their home. The people who raised you, the people who, your mom, she fed you, changed your nappies. She bore so much pain wearing you, you looking after you. And when she is it at, in need to be looked after, you send her to old people's home. In Islam, absolute it's a great sin god tells us worship god and at the same breath he says and be dutiful and kind to your parents so much importance so this message of islam you will see your heart will resonate it makes sense it's from god god tells you like you know all this environment would you love God and someone else equally with God when they have no right to be loved and appreciated and glorified and praised? You don't worship your mother and father the same way you are giving the gratitude to God. To God is the only right to have the utmost reverence. Your parents do not have the equal right to that kind of reverence. In Christianity, something along the way, the problem happened by this distortion. Instead of worshipping God alone, there are now two partners. People are giving their reverence to the Son of God. I don't even know what that even means. If you think about it, God has in, having a son. And then there's the Holy Spirit. That's a partnership. God would never forgive anyone worshipping other than him alone How do you know because can or i will tell you because god has a right he created he, us i'm, I'm explaining my friend i'm explaining when god created us he didn't say you know what you worship Thor, diana apollo zeus it's okay no god always told the prophets and messengers 
The worship is only the right of God. He gave you life, the sustenance, so worship him. Don't worship the false gods because that is the trick of Satan. He wants you to fall from God's grace by worshipping all this creation, your own desires and so on, because he wants you to go to hell. Because God did not create you to worship a banana or a rat. He created you to worship him because by doing so, you would have fulfilled the test that you are here for. God could have automatically put people in paradise and people in hellfire because he knows the outcome. But he wants us to be here to test ourselves against ourselves whether we deserve to go to heaven or hell. And the way to do that is by demonstrating that we are worshipping God alone and not worshipping a banana or a rat. Does that make sense, Gordon? So that's why I'm asking. I mean, Islam is something for you. Islam is something for me. Islam is something for everyone. Because Islam is the only acceptable religion way of life from God. It's not an alien religion from Arabia. Islam is not a new religion. It was a religion, the way of life of the first man. The Prophet Abraham, Jacob, Solomon, David, Noah, Moses, Jesus, all of the prophets, they brought the same Islam. Pure, unadulterated, sincere submission to the will of God. That is what Islam is. And someone who does that is a Muslim. So Abraham was a Muslim. Jesus was a Muslim. Noah was a Muslim. Peace be upon them all. Because they submitted and surrendered their will to the will of one true God. You and I can be a Muslim by doing the same. By submitting our will to the will of God. And how do we do that? By looking at the Prophet and taking him as the Prophet of God. Because then we know what the will of God is. Because I would not know what the will of God is to submit to. The Prophets and the Messengers show us what the will of God is. And that's where the role of Prophet is. So there are two components. Worshipping God alone, accepting that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah, God alone. Allah is a name of this unique God. This name is such unique about God that He asks us to be in um, relationship with, that there is no Allah S like a feminine form. There is no Allah M where it is like more than one God. One unique name in the whole world. So you know that even the name tells you this is the correct concept of God. And the second part is to say that Prophet Muhammad is the Prophet, Messenger of God and his servant. That's the two part of a declaration of Islam, to become a Muslim. It's so easy. One believes in their heart and declares it with their tongue that I witness and testify there is no God worthy of worship except Allah God alone. And I bear witness and testify that Prophet Muhammad is his servant and his Prophet and Messenger. That's it. What do you say, Gordon? As you get older, I was brought up as a Christian, but uh, the older I get as a teenager, you start dropping out of church. And I don't know if that happens in a Muslim family, or that's maybe more strict. I don't know. But uh, for me, it just drifted away. And I think the older you get, as, as I, when I was younger, to following Christianity or any religion, I think it gets more difficult. Some, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think some people do want to find something. But for me, at the moment, I don't. I just find being disappointed. What are you gaining when you become a Muslim, and what are you losing when you? For me, I'm not losing anything. Um, so, in my view, yeah. I'm not so, so if you anything. become a Muslim, you don't lose anything. You gain the salvation. Well, so, as, so as we a, invite a you to become a Muslim. As a Christian, I would as well. But at the moment, I, I just, I back to what I've been saying is just try and be a decent person, and that's because, as I said, but when you say decent person, like who defines what a decent person is? Like, what's the criteria for a decent person? Kind, look after people, be respectful. Um, those are our principles in life. But it's nice to have some people, and if they're not, then they're not everybody. I don't know. Everybody loses their temper or loses their way for a minute or so. But that's that's life at the moment. But to follow, I'm not at the moment. It's, I think, uh, as I say, that the older you get um, from a Christian point of view, for me, it's like I to go back to church. I think, to be honest, I think if, if Jesus or God 
Jesus came back on earth and saw that the money that the church has would probably be disgusted with the amount of, you know, the church had so much power back in mid-century and things. I think he'd be, he didn't even have a worshipping place. It was just nothing. He didn't need anything to worship. So for me, yeah, I think it'd be... Uh, so that, that's interesting. You've made a very good point. In fact, that's one of the contentions I have with certain religious ideologies as well. For example, there's a Hindu um, festival which is a giant idol and everybody gathers milk and just pours it over the idol okay. and it's just wasted. Yeah. Um, in Christianity, of course, you've got the, the, the process that the, the, the big priests and the vicars, they don't get married. And because you're stopping something that is you know, natural, it's, it's a force of nature, frankly, yeah. to procreate. And when you're restricting that, somebody made a good point. They said, to the best of the Christians, are the priests and the vicars, they're not getting married. The best of the females are the nuns, they're not getting married. <laughs> Who the heck is getting married? <laughs> you know what I mean? So the thing is, Gordon, I guess the point that I'm trying to say is, <clears throat> bearing what you've said in mind, Islam doesn't fall within that trap. Because let's just say you were to convert to Islam. Let's just say, let's just go through it. On the spot, all you'd have to say is, I testify there's none worthy of worship besides God. And I testify that Muhammad is the messenger of God. You say the English, so you understand it. You say the Arabic. That's it. You wouldn't need to be drip, um, you know, put in water. You, there wouldn't need to be somebody with cloaks coming. There wouldn't need to be a ceremony. You could just do it with a you know, broken cup in your hand and an and a Italian dinner in progress bag. It's literally as simple as that, Gordon. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, because, think about it. If the message is coming from God, and it's God's message, and we're saying that, look, the Quran is not going to be, you know, changed, doctored, and it's God's responsibility to look after it. It doesn't matter what humans do. Like today, if every single scripture was burnt, every single, you know, ancient Abrahamic scripture was burnt, the Quran is the only one that can be written word for word. Because of what Brother Mansour said, it's memorized, it's preserved through a live language, through manuscripts. And when it comes to your connection with God, you know, even as a non-Muslim, you have a connection with God. You can raise your hand. If I was to oppress you, you know what Islam tells me? But even if Gordon was to raise his hand against me, God would hear your prayer as well. So you don't have to pay something to a mosque or you don't have to go to an imam and say okay come four o'clock with 30 pounds no anybody who's a muslim yeah. you raise your hand there's no even the 2.5 percent of our annual savings that we give every year every muslim that you know their money which is a certain nisab level mm -hmm. the threshold level we give it to the poor people and if we're slacking with that we're held responsible you can't just give it to the um the Imams or the Sheikhs or the Muftis, it doesn't work like that. And even the mosques as well. It's exactly like you said, Prophet peace be upon him, used to pray very simply and you might, even if you're lucky that you on your way out, you might see the Muslims praying, you know, just on the side over yeah. there, even as you leave the park, literally on a mat. Yes. It's as simple as that. Even if, let's just say that, that bag, because the pr place, if it's a bit impure, I just put the bag down, I just determine which direction is the Kaaba, you know, the, um, the, the black stone. I, I, I used to go to uh, West Africa uh, a lot on holidays, and 95% uh, in Gambia are Muslim, 5% yes. Christian. So, you know, I see the guys every day, morning. I didn't know what, I didn't understand when I saw them, they had lots of these fancy colored pots. And I when I init went there initially, I went, what's all this for? I mean, when you watch them, they're cleaning their hands and their feet and then they're praying. So, oh, okay. I didn't know uh, anything like that. So, it's literally as simple as that. Yeah, because yeah. Gambia, you're right, I've had the honor of going there a couple of times. Fantastic people. Yeah. And because it's a hidden gem, not that many people kind of crowd it with tourism. So it's, it's fantastic. But exactly that. Just a bottle of water you can use to wash yourself, get yourself ready for prayer. And then just find a mat or a bag just in, just so you don't put your head in an impurity. And that's it. Anyone can pray. 
and that's the and that's the thing that if someone is claiming that this is truly from God, surely it should be accessible to everybody. You bring two six-year-olds here. You try to explain the concept of Trinity to a six-year-old. It's going to be very tricky, very difficult. You explain the concept of Tawfi, the oneness of God to a six-year-old. It's going to be very straightforward. So I guess, Gordon, what I'm doing is I'm just I'm just scaffolding these points, and I'm and I'm saying that look, if something truly came to be from God, surely it should be accessible. Number one, and number two, exactly like you're saying, it shouldn't be person orientated. Like if I want to get close to God, surely I shouldn't have to pay somebody. I shouldn't have to rely on a certain garb or a tire or a building. And in terms of, I would say the older a person gets, especially post 25. I would actually argue that people, especially Muslims, they try to search for God more. I'll tell you why, Gordon, because, you know, I'm sure you, you know the statistics, men every hour is a man who's committing suicide. And you know the heartbreak, because men, you know, are more kind of uh, invested in a relationship, especially when it breaks. Men find it difficult to get over that. So the thing is, the more a person is in relationships, the more a person is getting fired from work. I mean, just living life and just dealing with the, the kind of response and the problems that life you know, gives to every individual, it makes a person think, what's the point? And Gordon, it's when you think, what's the point? That's when, you know what? That's when God and that journey to God becomes closer. Because you're like, okay, which God? And that's what brings Mansour's example. Could it be a rat? Could it be an idol? Could it be, you know, a spirit and God and sun all in one? Or is it just one God? What makes the most rational sense to me? We delve a bit into science. Justin Barrett, the Oxford, the Oxford University, says that people intuitively, inherently, are predisposed to believing in God. So a person's like, okay, so there's this thing inside me that like I have this inclination. It's like a fingerprint, the creator says this. When I look at everything, the tree, I'm from a seed, someone plants that seed. Okay, when I see the concrete, the concrete came from somewhere, the shoes are designed from somewhere, the shirt was designed, the watch was designed, nice watch by the way. <laughs> you know the, 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 the cup was designed. Everything is designed, then surely I must have a designer. And my designer should be easy to reach, shouldn't require money, shouldn't require heavy, you know, carbs and money and stuff that a poor person in Gambia wouldn't be able to do. So you can to bring the years, you saw the poor person in Gambia, he was able to, you know, do the ablution. And you're able to see maybe, you know, one of the brothers from Edgeware Road who are a bit well off. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. them doing wudu, yeah. they'll be doing it maybe, you know, in a fancy basin. But regardless, whether you're rich, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, Islam is accessible for you. And you will see, as you're leaving, there'll be, because here there's only one row. When people are praying, Mansur will be there, who, you know, God willing, you know, he's able to articulate Islam, uh, articulate Islam very well. But even somebody that isn't, that's just, just wandered into the park, they'll be standing shoulder to shoulder with him. Yeah. Regardless of what st uh, stature you are, regardless of, you know, what um, ethnicity you're from, shoulder to shoulder. Mm. And you have one individual who has the most knowledge. Again, it reflects the Quran that the highest of you are those that are high in deeds. Only that person is an imam and sometimes the imam is even of a smaller age than the people following him. So that's, that's the beauty Gordon and, and that's why we're, we're able to tell you so categorically, we're able to say no, Islam is not like the things that you're going to be hearing. We're, we're saying that Islam is special, it's unique. In every character, in, in every race, in every race, Islam will get the gold medal. They will come to the top. When, in terms of preservation, in terms of, look, Jesus spoke Aramaic. Aramaic is not a live language. It's not accessible. People can't access what God has said. Why would God pick a language that's not accessible to the end of time? Okay, then you've got the Torah, Hebrew. Hebrew, again, is not the first thing. It's not, you know, a mass-used language. You've got the Vedas in Sanskrit. 
It's not a live language. So, the Quran is in Arabic, it's a live language. Many scripts here in the University of Oxford you can get. It's memorized from beginning to end by children as young as six. So, surely a holy book that if I'm saying, Gordon, you must follow this book, and you're like, all right, is this the same book that was there, the time of revelation? We can categorically say yes. Christian would say no. The Torah, the Jewish person will say no. The Hindu person will say no. You're like, okay, plus one for Islam. What about the sayings that your prophet said? What about him? Oh, we've got chains of transmission. Yeah. I can tell you that the prophet said this particular thing. Al maru ma'a man ahab. A person will be with whom he loves. I can tell you we got it from Ahmed. And then I can tell you he got it from Muhammad ibn Abu Adi. Then I can tell you he got it from Humayd at tawil Then I tell you he got it from Anas ibn Malik. He got it from the Prophet Muhammad. I can tell you every single person in the chain. I can tell you how reliable they are. That's what we need. We're seeing so much misinformation that Twitter needs community notes. Are you on Twitter? Uh, no, I don't use that. I can't. <laughs> so, I mean, I, as I say, I, I love watching different documentaries about either religion or, or Jesus or things. And um, there was a film made, we all know about it, and they tried to ban it in the 80s, The Life of Brian, it was about Jesus. But they said that the point that they were making, it wasn't going against uh, Christianity or religion. What, what they were actually saying was over 2,000 years ago, you know, there would have been, it would have been all standing, you know, not here, but uh, over in the East, um, 2,000 years ago, arguing about different sorts of religions. You know, when, when Jesus was there, he was like, oh, the, that prophet, and there would have been other guys, you know, that's why in, in one of the parts of the film, somebody's sandal came off, and everybody's going, that's a sign, follow the man with the one sandal. You know, it was, there were so many different types of uh, religions or, and groups, whether it be false or not. Um, and back then, we'll never know, I guess, what actually happened, why um, everybody follows Christianity and why uh, a lot of people uh, follow uh, Muhammad as well. I, but I love watching him, but I keep open-minded. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you why, Gordon. You've actually raised a fantastic point. Because there's a there's a thread of truth in all of these religions. Yeah. Because as, as Muslims, we accept that Jesus came with a book called the Injil. But then we believe it was distorted, therefore there was a need for another revelation. So there is truth. There's some truth in the Bible. We believe there's some truth in the Torah. We believe there's other prophets that have come with wisdom. That's why, as you know, the thing is, you know when you're just sealing the deed, and that's the beauty of Islam. A, a Jewish person would say, no, we don't accept Muhammad. A Jew, you know, a Christian person would say, we don't accept Muhammad. But a Muslim would say, we accept Jesus. We accept Moses. We just believe that the prophet Muhammad is the last prophet. They all came and they all just give me a few minutes. spoke is okay? about monotheism. They all spoke about you know, how to live one's life and not to be a slave of one's carnal desires. So there is definitely truth in all those things. But just like with anything, when you go to a shop to buy shampoo or soap, um, when it comes to shampoo, there's like 25, 30 different types of shampoos. And we don't stand there paralyzed with choice. Immediately we say is, like with me, I might go for the anti dandruff one. Yeah, yeah. Somebody might go for the sensitive skin one. But in order for me to do that, I, have to, I would, I, I should go there, I should read, I should see, okay, what are, okay, it's free from SNS and colors. Okay, why? What's wrong with SNS? Do, do a Google search, do my research. So it's the same Gordon. Like, on Netflix, you get these wonderful documentaries. Yeah. So there's so many of them. How do you determine which one you're going to see? Because you need the blurb. You're like, okay, okay, uh, how much time do I have? And can I watch this? And is it done by a credible source? Yeah. What are the stars? You know, what are the ratings? So I guess I'm saying the same for Islam as well. If something was truly from God, it wouldn't have died. The language wouldn't be archaic, inaccessible. It wouldn't be something accessible. You'd see the people today. The religion would be uh, the talk of the town. The only religion that's the talk of the town, the only religion that's the fastest growing religion, according to Pew Research, is Islam. And if you look at the vices and the problems, 
look at women, two out of three women are being sexually abused. But Islam says, you know what? Let the believing men to lower their gaze. You shouldn't be eyeing up women and tell the believing women to cover themselves. But you shouldn't be displaying, you know, your beauty. I mean, that beauty is for people more deserving. Not some random Larry who can I was, uh, my ex-wife was uh, a Muslim, but she didn't follow it too much, but what she said, well, what she said, she didn't, she didn't really follow it, she's going back a little bit now and doing some things, but she said that some, some things in the Quran, like the women cupping themselves, that it's taken out of context now, and she said it was, it, what's it say, cover your nakedness or something like that, but in her view it was like, it's just gone too far, you can, but if, if, I'm going to argue the point here now, if God had given a woman such a beautiful face, why would he want her to cover it up, basically, that would be my argument, and I think, yeah, I, I, I don't I don't agree with that, but that's that's my sort of thing. Why would you want to cover up your own face? Gordon, Gordon, would you say the breasts of a woman are beautiful? Absolutely. Why are they covered up? Decency. <laughs> You've answered it? Decency. But, you know, the, the, I'll, I'll, this... No, no, I'll, I'll tell you. you. So, so the western level would be just to cover the top bit and the bottom bit. The Muslim level is just to extend it. So the question now is, how do we determine which one yeah. is the correct one do you see? Yeah. So that's when we then go to an objective source. Going back, you know, 2,000 years, when, was, when would that have been introduced then? The, I can't remember what it's called, when women would cover themselves. Was that, was that when Muhammad was alive? Of women covering themselves. That was brought in then, or was it brought in before that? Yeah. So bear in mind, every prophet that's come, yeah. they've come with a sharia, with teaching. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, even if you look at the mother Mary, you know, Jesus, Jesus' brother, sorry, Jesus' mother, that's even spoken of in Christianity, whenever they depict her, they never depict her with long blonde hair blowing in the wind. Too much noise, I can't hear, sorry, so I just yeah. Yeah, very noisy. Maybe, but I don't know, uh, again, maybe I'm a bit ignorant for that, but maybe that was the way that they dressed without being religious. They might just, I don't know. I mean, a Christian would argue, I mean, who would be more religious than the, the mother of Jesus? <laughs> you see, yeah, so yeah. It has to come from, I mean, the supposed, according to Christians, the, the mother of God? But this is a woman that surely is given birth to God. So, I mean, if it's not religious, then what is it? It has to be religious. Yeah, yeah. That's what a Christian would say. I would argue, even when you look at Sikh women entering the Gurudwara, the hairs are, the, the hair are covered. When, when Hindu women are entering the, the temples, their hair is covered. Yeah. So this is something innate. And then, if, even if you are to be a skeptic and you're supposed to say no, I would then go to science. And I would say, what have the scientific experiments told us about the sexual kind of representation of the hair. And the studies do tell us that the hair is innately sexual. And it does have sexual value. You can check this research. I think some um, Indian men as well, that's, uh, they cover their hair. It's very, I don't know, what, uh, what religion they are. In, uh, in the, Sikh, the Sikh, Sikh people, yeah, yeah. because it's not covering the hair, they're tying the hair because the hair is quite long because they cannot cut their hair. Yeah. So if they, if, you, if they open their turban, it will be like a woman's length hair. Yeah. So they don't, they're forbidden to cut their hair. The religious ones will not cut their but hair. They, they, going back to this stage, I think they're... They believe hair is holy. I yeah, the point they don't even have to wear a helmet. They can, I see. Yeah. Yeah. They're exempt from various yeah, things yeah. because it's such yeah. a big uh, yeah. hair um, accumulation. Big helmet. So, Gordon, I just want to um, bring back to the same point which is I think is very important for you to reflect on. You as a Christian understand no, I wouldn't say no no culturally Christian okay yeah understand how people can be religious or not religious in a belief system. You can link that with the concept of God and guidance that God gives through people then organized themselves in worshipping God through collective guidance because we live in the communities, we don't live in isolation. So that's why religious 
um, laws and rules and regulations, dietary laws, whatever, they come as a package. So when you compare all of this and look at the trace and, and you trace the history that people are corrupting the message of God. That's why the cultural packages, what they give you, there's some falsehood and some truth all mixed up. What we're saying is, now start thinking the most critical way in which how do we decipher and filter and sieve out the all truth from bits and pieces of truth out there. If there were no all truth package out there, then you'd say, okay, I'm going to take some from, from here, I'm going to take some from there and so on, right? Yeah. But if you have a package which is exactly representative of a whole complete truth package, that is the best alternative to go for. And this is what we are saying is Islam. So when you research and look into it, yeah. if it makes sense, you know what to do. Two things to declare in your heart, with your tongue, and then you start practicing, become a Muslim. The one, how many billions of Muslims? Uh, one More than 1.5 billion Muslims on planet Earth. More than one quarter of the Earth population is a Muslim. You are going to be one of those proud Submitted to God, God willing. Well, for me, I think as well. I think you maybe it might some something might come to me, but at the moment it's there's nothing. I'm not looking for anything, and so you know I'm not down. I'm not. But Islam is coming to you. Your lowest point. Gordon, well, Islam maybe, is coming to you. Maybe. You're not yeah, going to Islam. Islam maybe. is coming to you. Today, <laughs> Islam came yeah, to you. Sometimes people ask for a sign. Islam came to you today. It doesn't always happen. Uh, even in life, I look for something to look for a sign for, for anything. But, but Gordon, come. you have to do it yourself. Yeah. Islam came to you today, Gordon. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. All the best. You take care. It's a pleasure speaking to you. you too. And nice. hopefully, we meet again in the park and talk. See you guys. Carry on speaking with your Muslim friends, read the Quran, read a biography of the Prophet Muhammad There's all to gain, nothing to lose. Because all we are trying you to do, just all, like ourselves, is to be safe from the hellfire. That should be our primary focus, to be safe from the hellfire. And if it was from a human being, the, the things and the practices of Islam would be centered around human beings benefiting. But the fact that it's from God, Islam came to preserve five things. Firstly, religion, which is to protect monotheism, which, from a fiscal sense, doesn't make sense. Yeah. Because the more idols you have, like the Arabs before, you know, the final testament came to the Prophet, there were so many idols and they would, you know, there would be a payment that you do to come and, you know, cleaning the idols, a lot of people were employed. To say that there's one God and, you know, he's, he's you know, not around you, he's not an idol that you can kind of, buy and purchase and stuff like that yeah. that's actually logically you know goes against that notion that you know it's about money then about life you know killing islam is against that you take one life then it's like taking the whole of mankind yeah. then it came to then number three is intellect that's why things like alcohol and drugs are forbidden otherwise it would have made sense that the prophet would have been merry making with beer and with women and stuff like that and he would have justified it in some way but when money was offered to him he declined it now what i found really fascinating about this he was offered women money and all of these things he said no somebody made a good point they said saying no here was actually a, was actually very significant because him saying no meant that he could never say yes again because you're closing that door. Because yeah. if he says yes a year down the line, people say, oh, but what about then? <laughs> oh, so you're after the money, so you want this, you want that. Yeah. Immediately proves him to be wrong. So then you've got intellect, alcohol, that was a big business. A lot of people, off licenses. You tell them, look, why are you selling alcohol? Oh, so many people buy alcohol. And even in, in Qatar, you know, Budweiser, you know, people enjoy themselves and this and that. So, you know, the Qataris saying no to alcohol was a big blow. And it forced a, forced a lot of people to actually think and go, you know what? Uh, you know what? I'm actually forced to actually appreciate what's around me rather than being drunk yeah. and just going about my life. And then you've, you've also got the thing to preserve wealth. And that's the reason why in Islam, interest is not allowed. 
because they mix the rich rich and the poor poorer. Whilst with the Prophet, peace be upon him, it would have made more sense. But you know what? Uh, once a year, just give me the charity money. The Prophet didn't take a dime. When he left, he didn't, he didn't leave with much. And that was non-existent. So the thing is, interest, which again, a big, you know, a, a lot of money. And it came to preserve family. And what about family? Oh, if you're in a, you do adultery, you know, that's not allowed. You know, you're breaking the family and that affects society. Whilst it would have made sense for the Prophet and his companions to be merry making the most. Oh, no, 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 no we can do this. But Islam says, look, there is a desire for a man to have a woman, but you do it in a proper way. You get married to her. There needs to be two witnesses. Yeah, you recite the words of God, you give her a gift. Yeah, you make sure her representative is there. And if you don't treat her well, that's half of your religion that's been corrupted. Half of your religion. So Mansur said about, look, you look after your parents. But this, look, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that if something was truly for man, why is it not feeding the desires of man? Why is it going against our desires, saying no to alcohol, no to adultery, no to drugs, no to interest, no to breaking of the family? So Gordon, the more you go now, the thing is, it's like you know when you're buying a car and you're going to buy a black BMW and you're on your way home, you tend to notice all the black BMWs. <laughs> yeah. Because now you're kind of more open and conscious to that. And you know, there's a German philosopher, Adorno. He was Theodore Adorno. He said the magazines, TV, news, and all of these things, they're actually they're a form of destruction. He was an atheist, said these are a form of destruction that actually take us away from making political impact and secondly, from questioning your purpose. So you know what, I actually sympathize with the fact that maybe you're not thinking too heavily in this because of, I mean, look, the, the rat race. You, you have to get up. If you're not earning, if you're not doing something, you're not paying your taxes, you're out in your, you're out in your rear. You know, you, your kids don't want to know. You have to be somebody. As a man, you have to be a high value if you want to keep a woman. You know, otherwise, like what? You know, there's a saying. They say everybody has an inherent value, a pet will have an inherent value. You, you love them regardless. A child, you love them regardless. A woman, you love them regardless, except for a man. Ask him, what does he do? How much money does he have? So for us, we may have come across it, but it may have been in a different wrapping. And that's why Buddhism has appealed to you, because these principles of Buddhism, I would argue, most of these principles, if not all of them, are in Islam. And the things that aren't there are actually things that are just restricted to certain individuals. For example, just going and living in a mountain. Not everybody can do that. But this concept of stepping on one's desires, that's in Islam. The concept of meditation, that's there. In fact, it's, it's present in a more advanced form. Rather than just sitting and just repeating a mantra, what you're doing is you're repeating verses that are transcendent. These are verses, not just a random word, but these are words of God. So each frequency, each uh, you know, um, you know, hertz or whatever you want to call it, it resonates not only with your heart, not only with your ears, but with your soul, with the things and you know, consciousness. We don't understand it resonates with even our consciousness. That's why when you speak to certain Muslims, they will recite the Quran, just giving you a kind of flavor of what the Quran offers. So as when we pray, we are maybe reciting the words of God. And what are we doing? Oh, help this person do this? No. All praise be to God, the Lord of the worlds, hmm. the most kind, the most merciful, master of the day of judgment. Thee alone we worship, thee alone we ask for help. So again, what's materialistic about these things? And that's why even newspapers that tend to post anti-Islam headlines like the Daily Mail, if you YouTube, if you Google this, they will say that the happiest people are the Muslims. You know, I think it was in 2016. And th that's the thing, Gordon, that now when you're a bit more aware, it's the thing, like when a person, like God says this as well, you claim that there's no God, but when you're in a ship and it's sinking, <laughs> you call out to God. So we do, we do call out to God. And I sympathize with you because there's so much attention and there's real intelligent minds vying for our attention in the form of free social media. I mean, every few months there's a new social media coming up. 
just recently a new social media came out that's going against Twitter. What was it? Threads. Threads. And then we had Snapchat and the likes. They're vying for our attention. They're trying to even TikTok. It was, I think it was like a certain amount of seconds. Then it went to a minute. It was 30 seconds. Then it went to a minute. Then it was going to like two, three minutes. So they want you to be on there so they can sell you stuff. So I sympathize with this fight. But then again, I will also ask you, when are you just sitting on your way home? Are you going by car or by car? I'm just going uh, and staying in the hotel five, five minutes away. Yeah. Let's, just say, let's just say you go to the hotel and you sit down. Like you're standing there so politely and you know, giving us this wonderful conversation. You go home and you're like, oh, you're tired and you sit down. That time that you're just sitting down, you're just looking out the window. You're thinking, what's the point of it all? Where am I going? So the Quran says this, it sympathizes you with these thoughts and says, where are you going? What, what does it mean? Do you feel that you created everything? Do you think that you came from nothing? And reading this, Gordon, and giving it a chance, I promise you, it's not even I think, I promise it will resonate with you. As long as you're sincere. As long as you're sincere. I'm conscious of your time yeah, and you know, yeah, you know, thank you for your time. Nice yeah. to meet you. Me too. It's Mansoor. Got a pleasure Shine, uh, speaking to you. As I say, it's good to have an idea of a different religion, what, what their religion is. Not to have an argument with somebody, but just to understand it. Yeah, basically. Yeah. I mean, I, let, I also like uh, one of the documentaries was, I don't know if you've heard it, um, not that long ago, maybe 30 years ago, they found these, um, the Black Sea Scrolls. Yes. And that was, that changed a lot of things. We haven't really heard much about it, to be honest. Yeah. I think, I think um, a lot of things have found that, um, basically they said that Jesus might not have been the person that you think he was, but we don't know, because they're not really releasing it. Uh, but, I find all that very interesting. That's where my curiosity comes. Uh, but I guess what we, what we think about that is if you're telling somebody that this belief in something will result in you going to hell, surely it needs to be something accessible and categorical for the layman. But I think as well, if, they, you know, if there is something written in the Black Sea Scrolls, I don't think they've deciphered everything. Yeah. It's got to the point where they say, well, should we release this because this is totally contradicting what was written in the Bible or who knows? But it's very interesting anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is a film because you're into documentaries called yeah. The Message. Who was the actor that played? Yes. I don't know, but he's a really good actor. Oh, that's an old Anthony one, yeah. Quinn. Oh, yeah. Anthony Quinn. That's an old one, yeah. Try watching that. Okay. Message. message. It gives you because an overview of the life of the Prophet. Okay. Yeah. The Message. Anthony Quinn as an actor. He might give you some accurate. something. <laughs> Alright, you take care. We have our next conversation, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah, go on. Um, brother,